Okay. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to theme eight, which is uh, future missions. Um, so my name is Craig Donnan. I'm at the European Space Agency at Nordvik in the Netherlands. Um, and I've been compiling together uh, quite a lot of information from a whole bunch of different contributors uh, to this theme, um, which you can see their names are on here. Some are with us today, some are online, uh, some are not. These are the contributions that we got. So we had uh, um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, about 10 submissions, but then we've been supplementing some of those with extra uh, um, content. So the whole idea here is to have a look at what, what's happened, uh, where we are today, and what, what's coming um, in the future. So just from the European Space Agency perspective, and thanks to Christine who's online, uh, with this talk, she's put this together for us, which is nice, showing us the SAR images that we have, starting in the RS-1, coming up to the modern era with Sentinel-1, and then in the future, Sentinel-1 Next Generation, C-Man SARS. Then we've got interferometers with the Harmony mission, uh, Sentinel-3 a little bit, um, the Next Generation. Um, then if you look at the altimeters, we've got a whole host of different altimeters, and you'll see some nice content from some of the uh, quite cutting uh, work um, that's taking place. So cutting that some of the figures came just an hour ago. So you, you, hopefully you'll enjoy that. And the way we'll try and do this is uh, for the people that are uh, better equipped to talk about some of these missions, they will do the talk themselves. Okay. So the first thing is, okay, during this 20-year period, we had this thing called SKIM, which was a nice, beautiful uh, 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 SAR special altimeter. I won't dwell on the mission, but... The point of this is that simulation, it's a key tool, and I, but it's also a creative scientific process to get to grips with what are we actually looking at with a radar on the sea surface. And we spent a lot of effort trying to organize ourselves to produce a tool called SEEPS. And, and if you think about it, when you're doing this, you start with uh, some kind of visual rendering of the sea surface. You then add the topography, the local incidence angles for your radar, your normalized radar cross-section, your radio velocities, then you can range gate according to, in this case, skim. And I quite like this because it gives you this sort of like psychedelic uh, view, but that's sort of how the radar is trying to actually see the ocean surface. And the point of this is it's moving. And when you've got um, the kind of altimeters, the kind of SAR sensors that we're working with, and you're trying to use those for synthetic aperture processing, then this is an important figure. Okay, so we had to simulate using a whole host of different tools, and several of you in the room have helped build these. I'm not going to dwell on this slide. Just to say that there isn't one size that fits all for any particular mission. You need various tools uh, that are specific, um, and you need to establish the performance metrics. Okay, so in the end, we were competing with Forum. Uh, we were the underdogs, and as you can see, the figure is the underdog, skims lower. But what it did say is um, the final conclusion of the whole escapade was the skim mission It's not recommended for selection as the ninth ether explorer, but it is recommended that other ways and means be sought to implement that skim mission concept. So it is ready for implementation. If anybody wants to talk to me afterwards, we can try to get it implemented. Anyway, so with that, I'm going to hand over to um, Christine. Are you online, Christine? Yes, I am. Okay, so you go, and I uh, will press the buttons. But first, we always have to show this slide because we are in a competitive phase, and we have four missions competing for Earth uh, Explorer 11, Cat, Nitrosat, Wyvern, and Sea Star. Sea Star is the ocean. Wyvern is looking at um, a dual pole conically scanning Doppler radar uh, for measuring winds in clouds. Nitrosat is understanding the carbon cycle. And CAT is a clever technique to look at uh, the atmospheric limb with a mapping capability. But over to you, um, Christine. Well, that's going to be interesting, Craig, because these are not the slides I remember. But No, uh... no, no. These are now. These are. These are. <laughs> you can have this one or we can skip this one. Yeah. I've put C-Star right at the end because it's kind of, um, I thought, Right. Oh, no, we've, okay. Well, we've got to start at the beginning. Sorry. Okay. Right. Okay. Sorry, guys. Um, bit of a cross wires there. Yeah. Uh, I was I was hoping to finish with Seastar. Seastar is actually, uh, as many people know, uh, it is one of the candidates for Earth Explorer 11. 
Uh, so it is not confirmed, unlike many of the other missions, which Craig has his knee in his gigantic slide pack. Um, but anyway, coming back to Seastar, so you've already seen a version of this from Roland's uh, uh, discussions on, on theme yeah. three. Uh, again, Seastar, uh, one of the candidates, Earth Explorer 11, currently in phase zero, and the decision whether or not uh, Seastar goes forward um, will be taken at the end of this year. There's a user consultation meeting in October uh, in Bucharest, I believe, where up to two candidates will make it to phase A. We hope to be one of them. Uh, C-Star is illustrated by this figure here, the Sentinel-2, famous Sentinel-2 image, which I use really to, to convey what it is we're interested in. We're very interested in this uh, uh, very small scale processes that we can see in uh, optical uh, high resolution SST images of those swells and filaments, what's commonly known as sub mesoscale variability in the ocean uh, ocean jargon. Uh, and particularly what we want to do is to measure dynamics at these small scales. Uh, so we are targeting, we have some very challenging uh, objectives of measuring dynamics, meaning currents and winds at one kilometer resolution with high accuracy. The reason we have to have that is that dynamically we know that the ocean changes character when we get around about the one kilometer scales. Um, one of the other, I won't go through all of this, but really the two other major uh, aspects of the sea star are the fact that we are targeting a short temporal uh, revisits. So we are aiming for daily revisits. Uh, but doing this over a number of years to build up uh, both uh, some information about how these processes change on daily scales, but also on seasonal scales and indeed on multi-annual scales. Uh, and then f the, the, since synergy keeps being mentioned, I'd like to say that this is very much what CSTAR is hoping to do, is by linking these dynamics to uh, marine productivity, uh, because essentially the relevance to all sorts of things, including carbon uptake, uh, marine productivity, food security, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, next slide. I'll try to be a bit quicker. Again, this is really just you've seen that picture from from Roland. Really, just to point out, we are at KU band. Uh, we use squinted along track interferometrics, are meaning that we are doing ATI, but in three different directions. Uh, actually, we're doing ATI in two directions, forward and backward, to give us the means to to, to measure uh, vectors. Uh, loads of uh, a very uh, interesting, innovative uh, aspects. In a way, the observing uh, configuration is very much like Harmony, but we have a slightly better uh, azimuth diversity. Uh, um, and we have all the benefits that comes from SAR, having an imager, uh, having directional spectra. Uh, polarization capability that is subject to the Earth 11 coast cap, which is a, a big issue for us because this is a big system. Uh, and then directional wave spectra a la Marcel uh, in the uh, squinted beams, hopefully uh, inherited from what Harmony is doing. Next slide. I uh, just point out Sea Star is just doing coastal, shell seas, and polar, so marginal eye zones. That's where those uh, small scale features are particularly relevant. Uh, it's the first time we'll have, or first time, we'll have these uh, total current vectors, wind vectors, and directional wave spectra. These are absolutely essential if you want to look at their interactions. Uh, unprecedented performance at one kilometer resolution, flexible temporal sampling to sample fast varying processes. I've already said that. And then next, I want to talk about OSCAR, which is the airborne demonstrator for CSTAR. Uh, this is a nice picture of Oscar there on the underbelly of the aircraft that we use, uh, which is uh, flown by uh, MetaSensing. Uh, again, it's uh, an exact copy of what Seastar is going to do. KU band, VV pole, three looks forward, backwards and sideways. And we can achieve five kilometers swath with eight meter pixel. Next slide. Example, we flew this last May. So this was a campaign off the coast of Brittany really just to say that the capability exists already, so we don't need to wait for CSTAR to be approved. We can actually do some science already with the airborne system that ESA has uh, has funded. So this was a very interesting case off the coast of Brittany with some very high strong tidal currents. And I'll show you just one example 
uh, sort of eye candy, if you like, of one of the flights that we did just west of Wesson, which is this island just offshore from Brest. Next slide. Which is what's shown here. So we have got this uh, this strip on the left hand side shows uh, one of the airborne uh, flights, uh, total surface current uh, velocities and the vectors, of course, because we get that as well, and showing some really nice uh, similarities with the model which is shown on the right. Some similarities, but also some key differences. Uh, and next slide. And if we show that in context of some spaceborne data here from Novasar, we show that the uh, current jets that we see, particularly north of the island, align really well with these uh, radar cross-section gradients that we see so frequently in spaceborne SAR images. Um, next slide. This is just to say why the CSTAR team is not present at CSAR is because we are currently, literally currently, the team is down in Minorca waiting for a um, good wind to fly Oscar again in the context of a SWAT med campaign. Uh, so that was taken, this, this was like yesterday, the middle is a, a SWAT image from a few days ago uh, showing the position of uh, eddies and so on in the Mediterranean just north of Minorca. And we're working in partnership with uh, some of the uh, uh, French teams um, uh, who are actually on the ship uh, currently in the Mediterranean, taking lots of measurements of some mesoscale currents and, and stuff like that. And I hope to present that at some point. So uh, remaining gaps, deficiencies, um, uh, for us, uh, calibration is a big issue. So this issue about this very long interferometric baseline that we have, do we, how do we calibrate any residual errors? We've seen a lot this week about the errors that we see in Sentinel-1 radio velocities. Hopefully we'll be doing better than that because we're using ATI. Uh, just like Harmony will not be as sensitive to, to these issues uh, as, uh, as Sentinel-1 is. Uh, the question which we are being put uh, all the time is, do we need telemetry in order to achieve the, uh, to remove those biases? I don't think it is necessary, but if ESA decide it is, we're probably not going to get selected because we'll be too expensive. Uh, there's an issue about uh, calibration. How do we apply the ASCAT type calibration to our SAR data in different azimuth directions? Uh, level two inversion, I think uh, Paco already made, did a very good job of explaining the subtleties of how we can do the inversions. There's many solutions and we need to have some kind of intercomparisons of the different solutions. Of course, the uh, the WAVs, wind wave outfacts surface velocity, which is what we call it, or the wave Doppler, which is probably uh, a better name for it. And then finally, validation. How do we validate these data for currents and winds uh, that we're going to get from, from CSTAR or indeed from Harmony or indeed still getting now from Sentinel-1? Um, next slide. Outlook, my recommendations. Uh, well, yeah. obviously, we want to select CSTAR for E11, obviously. And if it is, uh, we'll have a, a launch in 2031-32, which happens to be a couple of years after Harmony is launched, all, go, all going well, which means we could be in the, con in the configuration of having Harmony and CSTAR in orbit at the same time for several years. And I think we uh, that is something that the community, if it wants that, should ask for it to make sure that we rec recommend what we want both. Uh, at the moment, Harmony is uh, is really the biggest threat to CSTAR not being selected for E11 is the fact that Harmony will be flying pretty much a couple of years before. So um, there's huge amount of stuff happening internationally also uh, linked to small scales or to currents and winds. Odyssea being the other one, which is the uh, US-French mission that again, I think Roland mentioned or somebody mentioned earlier this, this week, uh, doing Doppler scatterometry. Again, it's a proposal, so we don't know what the fate of that. And really, our recommendation would be that we need to basically put all these things together and make sure we have some joint projects between ESA, NASA, CNES, whatever, to, to have these collaborations across different missions between Harmony, Seastar, Odyssea, and indeed Sentinel-3, next generation, Topo. And then finally, uh, a recommendation really which we, we must make is this need to have international programs to observe currents, winds and waves and validate these uh, measurements we get from SAR, uh, be it through SPURS type campaigns like they're doing in the US or longer term validation sites like Johnny uh, keeps talking about, this super site. 
I think that's it for me. Thanks, Christine. Okay, thank you. So, back home, over to you. So the idea is that we'll review a lot of this together, and then we've got breakouts where we can raise issues, but it's useful for everybody to see what's going on. Do you want this one? Here you go, mine. Uh, thanks, uh, Greg, and uh, super nice, uh, Christine. Uh, yeah, quick, quick. Uh, I agree with Christine. We need uh, Star to fly a few years together with Harmony. That would be great. So uh, uh, Harmony in a, in a nutshell. Uh, now Harmony is a multi uh, is a multi domain mission eh, because uh, as as you will see in a couple of slides. It flies and it depends on Sentinel-1, which means it flies uh, most of the time, it will be acquiring over, over land, but it has objectives in all the domains. Um, so we want to look at, uh, at we wanted to resolve the motion vectors over the oceans, as you can, as you, can, uh, as you know, to look at, uh, to look at small, small scale processes in the atmosphere and in the upper ocean. So we're really interested in everything that has to do with vertical fluxes, which are small scale turbulence in the atmosphere and, 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 and small scale turbulence in the in the upper ocean so yeah, you know these things um we are also interested in extremes eh? extremes is where i think harmony uh, will excel if you compare to sea stars i think sea star will do something better uh, harmony will do very will be very good for extremes because uh, it's sea so you can actually look through uh, through the clouds and through most of the rain so it's, it's and it will be a very good machine for this um we will also look at the ice uh, and during part of the mission, we will fly in a cross-track interferometry configuration so that we can make time series of digital elevation models to monitor uh, ice loss or maybe ice gain somewhere. Um, I'm not covering it today, but uh, we also have an experimental, uh, we want to experimentally look at the white swath altimetry with Harmony. And uh, we actually are convinced that it will work quite well, not as well as SWAT, but uh, not as good as SWAT, but uh, with a very large swath and actually quite good performance. And then uh, over land, you don't care about land, but uh, other people do care about land. Uh, we will be looking at at, uh, at at motion vectors as well. So getting uh, we'll, over land, we will be able to retrieve three-dimensional uh, deformation. And right now, we can get two components of the motion. With Harmony, you can get the third component of the motion and then get the full. But anyway, this is a CSR, so I guess you don't care. Uh, I don't need to explain what we want to do, eh? but this is what we want to do. Eh? So we are, it's really process oriented. Eh? So we are not aiming at uh, covering the entire ocean and then do something systematic. We really want to get uh, snapshots uh, that are representative of what's, of what's going on. So we all together so that you actually can try to improve our understanding of processes so that we can put at this better understanding of processes in the models. Uh, so we at the end of uh, a better model. So that's a bit the idea, uh, tying into the digital twins. Uh, we have to all tie into the digital twins because that's where the money is. And also is where the science is, uh, is going to. So that's what we want to do, uh, help drive the development of the models by resolving the small scale processes. Uh, Boring slide, but uh, to uh, advertise that we have a set of, uh, of primary objectives on, on the ocean. In fact, the ocean is driving the design of the mission right? because uh, the requirements that are, were difficult to meet were the ones relating to the ocean. And uh, so we're looking at air sea interactions, different aspects of air sea interactions, and we want to look at marine uh, atmosphere extremes. And that's important to have it so that we make sure that we acquire data over, uh, over tropical storms and uh, extra tropical storms. And of course, we want to look at the at, at, sm at small scale open ocean dynamics. Eh? That means uh, small scale uh, relative ocean uh, currents. And uh, the sub uh, so the, the refinement of the objectives is really relevant because you know it much better than I do. So you will do whatever you want to do with the with the data, but the capabilities will be there for you. Uh, there is a bit the mission timeline uh, to, to because people always ask uh, how much data will there be over the oceans now with a nominal mission uh, lifetime of five years the idea is to start in a cross-track interferometric con uh, configuration where over oceans you could do white swath topography but it's really meant for uh, for ice it's going to kick me out already and then we have uh, three years of the so-called stereo phase, which is the, the primary uh, phase uh, for, for the oceans, which uh, next slide will explain a bit better. And then towards the end of the nominal time of the mission, we will go back to uh, a cross-track configuration so that you can measure the, the height of the ice over glaciers and compared to what you measure at the beginning of the mission. 
And then typically uh, satellites last more than they, than they were planned for. So after that, we hopefully will go back to an ocean friendly configuration and then fly until the end of time or my retirement uh, looking at the oceans. That's the plan. Um, now, a bit uh, what we measure. Uh, so what we have, and this is a bit uh, maybe to understand what we're doing, actually, we have Sentinel-1, which is our illuminator, and then we have two Harmony satellites, which fly at uh, 350 kilometers ahead or behind. I like actually the number 366, because it's the number of pages in the report for mission selection. So I think it's a good number. And, um, and what you have is, um, is a distributed Doppler scatterometer, if you want to look at it, uh, at a very high resolution uh, distributed Doppler scatterometer. So we are looking at, uh, we are acquiring simultaneous, that's something which is different to what scatterometers do and also what sisters would do. We look at the same time at the surface from different effective directions. And uh, so you can, you can retrieve uh, winds uh, or surface stress equivalent winds uh, with the resolution of a SAR system um, by doing scatterometry. Uh, you can apply cone matrix and all these things. Um, we also measure Doppler from different directions, so you can retrieve the components of the surface motion. And, uh, and we also look at the wave spectra from different directions. Eh? And, and this means that the cutoff is in slightly different directions, as what Marcel already explained uh, two days ago. So we will get a, a, an increased uh, view of the, of, of the waves. Um, now we, we, okay, did you know, did you know, did you know? Uh, now we carry also a thermal, infra, a thermal infrared camera, which, start, which, which grew from being a cute little camera to being a quite complicated system with um, multiple views. And that will give you sometimes SST, and, and uh, I'm a radar person, so sometimes I look at, op at optical and thermal images and I see clouds. So most of the time you will not see SST because we will see clouds, but we, we develop the system in a way that we can use it to measure cloud motion. Yeah, so we and height. Yeah, so the idea is that the system will be able to estimate the height of the cloud of the of the cloud top, and also estimate the velocity of the cloud top. And I think that's super super exciting yeah, because if everything works well, you are going to get your uh, stress equivalent surface wind, and you are going to get an estimate of the of the wind at the cloud top level, with also some information about the variability of the so the, the turbulence at the at the top of the cloud. And I think this combination is really great, and right? that you can get at least two samples of the of the wind profile, and not just uh, what happens at the surface. Um, okay. Now some examples of what you can expect. Eh? So this would be this is simulated data for Sentinel. So the for Sentinel One backscatter. This would be the California coastal system. Uh, Sentinel One backscatter up, uh, Doppler uh, down, and then we are we are adding the two Harmony uh, backscatter and Dopplers, and then I, I guess it looks like you can expect to look. Right? So the backside looks similar in all three images, but with different levels because it's uh, directional, uh, direction dependent. And from there you can retrieve your winds. And the Doppler signatures, they also look sort of similar, but you can see that even the sign is flipping because you are looking at the surface from, the, from different directions. And from there, we can try to estimate uh, the surface currents if we are able to clean up the wave Doppler. And uh, so this is what we hope to give you in terms of level two products, not only that and much more than this, but at least uh, high resolution surface winds and uh, high resolution uh, surface motion. This simulation is very good because uh, we simplified it. If you put everything we know uh, now, uh, it gets much worse. Hopefully when we put everything we will learn in the coming years, it will get very good again. And I think that's about uh, it, yeah, because you removed my timeline, eh? but uh, launched uh, in 20... Oh. Yeah, let him go. Man. Is there? I let it go, I go. Oh, yeah, I go, I go. Oh. Okay. It's my slides. It's, oh, it's his slides, okay. Because he also works on Harmony. <laughs> Don't do away with the microphone. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Okay, and um, I'm going to tell you a little bit uh, about the radar instrument and what kind of data you're going to see. So more up to the level one. So, uh, and I explained to you also how ESA develops the Earth Explorers. So there was a call for Earth Explorer 10, open call. We received a number of proposals. Among these proposals, three were selected to be studied in phase zero. So both let's say all of these three proposals, we had two, two parallel studies, industrial studies, uh, phase zero to look at the feasibility of the implementation. And for Harmony, 
we had uh, Airbus uh, as a prime and Airbus responsible for the instrument. And now I'm following, I'm uh, calling it concept A. And uh, the second one was uh, Thales Italy with OHP. Uh, and they were developing the concept B. And uh, the results uh, of these two independent studies were in fact quite similar. You can here see on the top the Airbus concept and below uh, the, the concept uh, of Thales. So we have uh, two phase centers, uh, left and right, fore and aft. And in the center, there's a third antenna, a third aperture, which for the Thales concept is actually a split into two elements. So we're, uh, each wing aperture is uh, composed out of three, let's say, panels. That's how we set it up. And uh, from the numbers you can see here, in fact, it's uh, quite similar in terms of uh, antenna surface uh, and otherwise also quite similar in the setup. And this is the, the architecture uh, on the higher level. So you see, in fact, yeah, um, the, the, the antenna. Uh, the, the fore and aft antenna. So they are receive only for harmony. They are receive only for harmony. Uh, and they have uh, received modules. Yes, uh, receive modules in these panels. And uh, okay, anyway. Um, and then uh, we receive uh, both polarization in these uh, phase centers and uh, we have, in the end, six signals being recorded from the three antennas. So two polarizations for each of these antennas. And we have also some internal calibration, so we can very finely calibrate, in particular, the phase of our antenna, also relative to each other. So, and then everything is recorded in the uh, uh, central electronic so this is an antenna subsystem, and this is an electronic subsystem. So and this is uh, the level one performance uh, we expect. So here, in particular, for the cross-track interferometry configuration, where the two uh, fly together, there we can use all the antenna uh, phase centers together, and then we get uh, uh, this noise equivalent sigma zero sensitivity, which is uh, beyond our requirement of uh, minus 20 dB. And you see over the thrust, there is some variation due to the antenna pattern. So let's say for the third thrust, uh, we get uh, in the center much better. And the second parameter, which uh, we, of course, are very much interested in at level one is uh, the total ambiguity ratio, so how much ambiguity signal you're getting. And uh, there we also meet the requirement of minus 17 dP. So for the ocean surface, we, in this case, look at uh, the long track interferometry. So where we, let's say, make interferometry between the fore and the aft antenna. And uh, of course, we there have uh, reduced um, uh, antenna surface, therefore also our sensitivity per, let's say, uh, fore and aft antenna is, is reduced. Uh, but in the end, when we look at the surface velocity, we meet our performance requirement uh, to be better than 0 0.2 meters. And uh, so that's also, you see, in some cases, you tend to be much better in the center of the swath. Oops. Okay. Oh, you still have this one. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Right. Okay. Thank you. So, Pierre de Bois, where are you? He's here. So, you can just, we can just work through these pretty quickly. Um, some of the science challenges here. 
Um, do we have a microphone? We can just use here, yeah. Yes. So, um, so um, with our team, we are we have developed the end-to-end -end performance simulator for the Armani missions. So the the goal for those kind of simulators are to take into account uh, as accurate as possible the ocean surface, the instrument, the acquisition. Uh, chronograms uh, and specifics, uh, all the specifics of the platform and uh, the orbit, and to have a prototype um, uh, processing chain, uh, including the onboard processing, if it exists, L1 and L2 processing. So uh, to achieve uh, this challenge, um, we have different level uh, where we should uh, put effort and make some progress. Um, so the question uh, for the surface is what is the underlying physics that we have to consider in the model ocean surface? Because if, if, you, want, if you want something accurate, um, we are uh, facing uh, difficulties to make something efficient in a software point of view. And also, uh, perhaps sometimes there are some parameters that are not important uh, at the end uh, with regard to the goal to estimate the performances of a, of a mission. So the question we are asking ourselves at, at the beginning of, a, of the design of end-to-end uh, -end simulator is what are the parameters that we should consider in this simulation and what correlation uh, between them we have to consider. For example, should we put some effort to consider the um, currents and uh, wind uh, correlation so that our performances are correct or not. Uh, also, uh, we are using uh, lots of models uh, to, to describe the ocean, but it's better if we can use a data-driven uh, or um, approach and to use, for example, for Harmony. It would have been great that uh, we could use some of the Sentinel-1 images to, to make simulations. So we face other problem because the separation scales that we are considering in simulation are not exactly the ones that are uh, in the data. And so it's not trivial to use directly some result from Sentinel-1 to, to do that. Uh, we are using a mesh grid approach for the simulation. And uh, again, um, uh, I have to talk uh, about the sp uh, separation uh, scale um, because uh, this is software related and a geophysic related. And uh, it's, uh, it's a problem when we have to use models uh, that are also sometimes uh, using sep uh, separation scale. Uh, and we, a more general uh, question are about the design and the use of end-to-end -end tools for uh, every future missions. So uh, I think that we have to think about what are the priorities uh, in terms of what a performance tool has to provide uh, with regard to what uh, is the development, uh, the mission development phase. For example, at phase zero, uh, perhaps we can relax on some of the accuracy on the instrument and focus more on uh, what the physics is doing. And then uh, on phase B, we can, we can put some more effort to have a very reliable instrument um, modeling. Uh, the other question we should ask is, uh, how do we make an efficient feedback loop between our implementation of the ATBDs provided by science teams and the result from the implementation. And eventually, how do we change the ATBDs with the results we are obtaining with our simulator? And um, I want to emphasize that this kind of tools, they are not the solution to, to everything. It's, uh, it's good to measure the performance of a future, a future mission, but there are lots of other tools that are uh, better to do other things. For example, the scientific workbench, the, also the manufacturers of the satellites are making some simulations to show how their instrument will, uh, 
will perform. And so we have to think about the interdependency of the other tools uh, at the beginning of the, okay. of the missions project. So those are some of the things we can talk about in the breakout, which is useful, so thanks. Just the last slide here, and I'll move on quickly. Alco, any particular emphasis here apart from launch in 2029? That's the main thing. And then there's all the work in between. So thanks, guys. Okay, we move on to um, um, a GSR concept. Can I ask uh, Fuyao to come down? Yeah. So we have a presentation here on uh, the Beijing Institute of Technology. He's going to explain uh, the GeoLeoSAR ATI concept. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, if you go yeah. quite quick. Yeah. yeah, I'll be a little quick. So thanks for everyone that I have a chance to have my just share my uh, the result of some uh, researchers here and the GEO sorry is about the project that the China and our group is mainly work on it. So let's start with it. It's a uh, about a distributed CSR system. It's mainly for the ATI, just uh, the, this technology missions. And that just uh, then when we talk about the equation of the retrieval of the TICV, when we what we mainly take they care about is the velocity and the direction and, and as well as the geographical distribution of our, whatever the areas or our or our currents is. is. So uh, I will take care of the two objectives. One is the complete current vectors and another is the multiple, multiple geographical skills. That is the two part of our really care about. So when we talk, when we, what what would we do just uh, 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 mainly to acquire the ATI, uh, acquire the TICV? The one of the important technologies with which we are usually use is about the ATI. So it's a mainstream method, but we but we we, we will uh, when we think from the history of the ATI's development, we will think that uh, it's mainly developed from the traditional, which means that with a with a single SAR platform, and then it 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 concentrate more on the on the different loss directions. So the so the distributed ATI SAR system is is come from and then and then we will talk about the GEOLU SAR system. It's a bit about based on the China's GEO SAR, and we be launched soon, by the way, and it could be used as a what it's really care about is a it's it's as a luminous source. And it's for distributed star system in the future. So, the GEO star system is when it is what we call the GEO synchronous star system. It's uh, when we the traditional star and what is mainly worked on is the OEO star. Its orbit height is less than one thousand kilometers, and it has small swath width and with a long resistance time. So it has drawbacks. It has the slow response to emergencies. Especially for earthquake and the Okay, thank you. So when we care about the orbit height, the GEOSAR comes here, and the, we can we can find that the coverage of the GEOSAR is from the STK, and uh, this the has a larger illuminator areas than the LEOSAR, and its beam foot coverage of GEOSAR is larger than ever. So it has the benefits from here. And, and what can we use GEOSAR to? Uh, the applications of GEOSAR, it has more wider coverage and it's to for better for imaging and has, it also has a continuous observations. And especially for emergency management, it will be good for flood monitoring earthquakes and debris flow, et cetera, this, like this emergency situations, so. And when we talk, I would give it faster about the history. It's, it will be proposed by the professor Tom Yasso in 1978. And then uh, pretty like the system like, which is called the bistatic parasitic GOSR comes out. It's just like the distribution concept that comes out here. And then the GOSR system comes with a lot of just the configuration designs. It's about from a lot of countries. And then it, what, we, what we are, exactly do from in China is 
just uh, do the like this, like this, just timelines. And what we just uh, the currently stage is about the the next one. It will be just uh, launched soon. So, so what our group is mainly research is about is the full link of the G, of the satellite design. It's, but uh, the first is the system design. It mainly just focuses on the resolution analysis. It uses the gradient gradient theory and the projection theory. And the second, the imaging algorithm for GEOSAR, it's about it has a long just a synthetic times or integral times. So it's hard for the resolutions and we use some just like accurate signal model and 2D NCS algorithms to better to imaging. And then about the ionosphere and analysis and the, and the compositions, it's about the the way from the signals transmitted from the satellite and then reflect back. It comes It comes through the the atmosphere. So uh, we use the time space varying models and the scintillation sampling models. And then the, it's about another applications of the GeoSAR. It's about DINSAR and the TOMOSAR. So uh, and we also used some, uh, ex uh, do, did some experimental validations here. So, so let's talk back to the distributed star system. The acquisitions of the complex currencies velocities. ATI SAR technology is the main what we want to accomplish in this distributed SAR system. The OG SAR is a stable irradiation source. Our SAR may be just a, as a passive receiver, so it's just convenient. So it has several advantages. When you just only see the GEOSAR, it has shortbacks and it has advantages. The advantages of GEOSAR is just what I say. It has large irradiation area. It has slow and steady motion, just as a steady, a stable, uh, just a source. And but it has shortcomings, especially for its long integration time. It's bad for coherence in ATI. So and it also has a poor resolutions. When we just uh, the, I mean the upper limitations of the resolutions is, it cannot just accomplish them, uh, a more a more precisely or accurate process or bad or finest imagings here. So especially for the ocean, and also the LEOSAR is ha it also has it has short integration times, but uh, it uh, it has also a great resolutions, but it also has shortcomings. It's only just the one, just a. Uh, LS directions for ATI measurement, just uh, I mean for the traditional ATI just technologies, and it high, also cost high for just applying on distributed star systems. So when we just combine these two systems, becomes the distributed star system. It just uh, had this advantage: it's like the module observing angle directions at the time, and then at least two LOS velocities when applying a TI when using time division measurements. Just like when we firstly. Just assuming that the star, that the C surface is a stable processing, and then we can use just the, between the short time div division, we can use the complete the TSAV. So, but there are some difficulties here. The difficulties one is about the configuration. It's, you mean I mean the distributed star system configuration optimization, me optimization method is always difficult. So we proposed uh, some methods here. It uh, had difficulties in much de degrees of the freedom and uh, multiple target parameters and a large difference of geometry, just like what I listed in the table. It has several targets and several parameters which, which is just uh, waiting to be optimized. So we, we just uh, translate these problems into the mathematical problem Mod and we built the mathematical molding of it. So the we, we and we also we use the uh, just the genetic algorithm, which may, which named the NSGA three, just the algorithm to, to do this optimization. And the difficulty too is that the processing methods. I mean, the, it's it's different from the traditional ATI because it has another terminal which is just uh, transmitting the signals, but it on, but it didn't receive or just. Uh, whether it receive or not is to be just to be decided. So, the 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 phase models have to be just uh, rebuilt. And then we just uh, do some researchers here for the bias of this mode, especially in this mode in the multi-view observations. So the ATI phase is proposed here. And then we did some simulations of that. One uh, 
the left is our what how we to do some optimizations here but uh it's it's not uh, we, we didn't ask it for for just uh, more precisely because we if if only it, it once once it it uh, attains the requirements that we need they just uh, think it's it is proposed that it's probable for our optimization work and then we use just uh, this configuration this configuration parameters to do some of the simulations of the of the sea surfaces to just uh, try to do some outwise velocities retrieval so it shares it shows the uh, not bad uh, or just the pretty precisions of the LS velocities and then there's uh, some still some knowledge and gaps and deficiencies here especially for the you mean I mean the high precision to two-dimensional TLCV is still need to be studied because that that is not exactly the simultaneous acquired at the same t at a time so how to acquire the TLCV at a time is still a problem and then we we just uh, put up two just uh, concepts of here that is to still to be decided one is the using time division that is method for ATI and it can be just uh, acquired for 2D loss measurement. And another way is to applying just a more passive value star system because it's just like the solar terminal here and it can provide more and longer time and chances that you can use. So uh, another, uh, and the last is the outlook and the recommendations. The first is the alternative concept for harmony. I think it's it's more like some some there are some similarities in just the, this distributed star system these designs and it's maybe a, just an alternative way for for the ocean retrievals and the, uh, and and as well as uh, and other dynamic or static parameters to retrieve and uh, the others is about the GEOSAR, how to use it I mean uh, it is going to be launched it's for sure so what we use the GEOSAR for the for in the future is is still it's still a question that we need to consider. So it's I think the a stable iteration source distribution uh, distributions is has is is one of its most uh, distributions. Uh, uh, one is one of its figure uh, figures that we may just uh, have to be used as a as potential tasks. So how, uh, how uh, and that's what we mainly to just uh, use as a GEOSAR limiter. <laughs> and then this is our groups. And I come from China, the universe, the Beijing Institute of Technology. So if you have other in questions about uh, the GEOSAR researchers here, you can just uh, contact us. So so that's, the, that's finished. Thank you, sir. <laughs> I don't know us here. <laughs> no, that's very good. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. OK, so please now, uh, we're going to run through very quickly some of the other things. And if you're interested in what we're going to show in the Rip Roaring Tour coming up, come to the breakouts. But I wanted to make sure that we got those three key talks there because those are really new future missions that are coming. Now we're, we have another new, new mission coming, Biomass, which is our P-band SAR. It's dedicated to, uh, ocean, to, to the carbon flux. This is what we're looking at, a P-band SAR at 435 megahertz, 6 megahertz bandwidth, so you're around about 70 centimeter wavelength. As a 12 meter static deploy, uh, uh, reflector, it's a mesh deployable reflector. Um, so it's quite a nice system. There's a picture of the, the mesh. It's currently integrated. Uh, we're in the validation and testing phase and we're looking to launch in uh, quarter three, 2024. So it can do uh, SAR polarimetry. Uh, they are planning to do uh, polymetric SAR interferometry and SAR tomography. I'm not going to dwell on this because it'll take a whole presentation, but we can talk about it in the breakouts. The coverage is here. The, the restrictions are based on the uh, uh, United States uh, Space Objects Tracking Radar. Um, but we have many areas where we can and will acquire. And as a best effort, there will be acquisitions for non-forested areas. And these are shown in yellow over the ocean, sea, uh, and ice regions of interest. But there can be others. And if you have some recommendations, please come talk to us here. Uh, there are several of us in the room. Stand up and show your name. Yep, he's your man. So if you want something specific, then put your request in now, uh, and we can put that into the map. Um, Okay, so I'm not going to dwell on all this because we just want to have time. Um, it's actually quite an interesting 
way that this mission is flown. So we acquire three simultaneous swaths, and then we roll the satellite to acquire the next set of swaths. Um, we can go through this in great detail in the breakout. And over time, we build up uh, a series of overlapping swaths uh, during the different phases. But it, um, this gives you a better impression of how this whole thing is working. So it's quite different than the way we normally fly uh, our spacecraft. Okay, so we're repositioning, acquiring data, and then we're re revisiting. But the revisits are quite long, over nine months in some cases. So the mission performance in terms of the total ambiguity ratio is at the top, and you can see the noise equivalent uh, sigma um, uh, uh, normal sigma zero at the bottom. So it's not the best for the ocean, but um, it will be useful, and we will have to have a look at what we see. Okay, so... There will be open science, it's open software, open data. Uh, there is a mission algorithm and analysis platform where you'll be able to play with the data. And uh, there is a GitHub repository with many of the algorithms already in. So there'll be a high operational duty cycle. It's about 50% in, uh, so there's 50 minutes every 100 minutes. Um, and um, short temporal coverage in some phases. So please talk to us and let us know where you want specific acquisitions. So I'm going to move on to Copernicus. Uh, this is our greatest and latest uh, uh, graphic that shows all of the different expansion missions. And here, uh, we'll start quickly with looking at... Okay. Don't know why that... Oh, there we go. It's got to catch up. Sentinel-6. The reason I'm showing you Sentinel-6... Come on, computer. We have two Sentinel-6s, one's on orbit at the moment, and then the other one will be launched in 2025, carries a SAR nadir altimeter. And there's been a lot of nice work uh, done recently with this. Your computer's breaking, you know. I broke your computer. Oh, that's back. Okay. Go. Not doing anything. Uh, okay, anyway, when it finally comes back, we get the video, we don't need the video. Next. Broke it. I really, I uh, uh, still really did break it. Nothing's working. Now you I did break it, man. really broke it, man. Anyway, we've been working with the, uh, with the SAR altimeter, and um, in particular, the digital back end of the Sentinel-6 altimeter in combination with its continuous burst mode, if you like. So it's continually acquiring data. We don't have any gaps in the, in the data stream like we do from Sentinel-3. Gives us access to a new set of parameters that we haven't really explored before. It is broken. Isn't it? It's break. Big time broken. Like Sentinel One B. No, Sentinel One B is not broken. <laughs> is it the WebEx? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah. No, it's gonna take a while, but you just go on. How long does it take? I don't know. Oh dear. So let's find out. That that's that yeah. it's that broken. Wow. It's going to cost you, Greg. Yeah. yeah, as usual. There you go. Overloaded everything. Well, when it comes back, we will have some uh, we will have some nice examples of what we can do with the altimeter when we process in fully focused SAR. And when you do this, you've got ambiguities from the radar on both sides of the nadir of the nadir point. But nevertheless, over the ocean, we start to see some really interesting stuff. Uh, we also start to see some fantastic stuff in over the ice. Now, over the ocean, uh, Marcel has got a couple of little example imagettes that show you how we can exploit the Doppler, because, of course, you've got some azimuth variability in the Doppler from the nadir, which allows you to get at wave spectral information, but also potentially some winds from, derived from that. And over the ocean and the ice, uh, we can now retrieve images uh, and we're having to work out how we can resolve the ambiguities. But nevertheless, in many cases, those ambiguities are so obvious. And as long as you know what you're looking for, it's still providing extremely useful data.
So I think the, 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 the generation of altimeters that we've got on orbit at the moment, Sentinel-3 as well, although Sentinel-3 has, uh, it's, it's, it's got a different uh, uh, chronogram in the radar, meaning that we have small gaps between the bursts, making it a bit more problematic uh, to process in fully focused. But nevertheless, there is an 80 hertz level 1A data set available there that's pretty much underexploited at the moment. So it really is giving you access to the full power of the, of the SRAL instrument. And that's, that's waiting to be unpacked and used. What it does do, though, is it, it goes back to some of the discussions we we're having this morning. And it raises the issue about what is sea surface height? What does it really mean when you start to look in these kind of uh, radar geometries with these kind of radar instruments? Uh, when you get to very, very fine and long track resolutions of, you know, tens of meters, uh, we're not really seeing the spatial average that a conventional pulse limited nadir altimeter will give you, which is really, you know, that's an integrated average over several kilometers radius. And here you decimate all of the wave information and it's directional. That's the theory, at least. So an integrated sea surface height makes sense. When you know process in terms of synthetic aperture and you've got very fine strips of data, what does it mean? It's certainly not the same parameter. And depending on how the way, how the sea state is presenting itself to the actual altimeter, then you've got all sorts of issues there to do with biases. Well, I don't really use the word bias, but the way that you actually conceptually consider what the sea surface height actually is, is not the same. That's it. There we go. So we'll start with this one. This is a, a quick example of the first image that we processed using the nadir altimeter. This is a Sentinel-2B uh, image from Azure Nievak. And here's the Sentinel-1 corresponding uh, image, roughly about the same time. And this is the SAR image that was acquired here in, in, in the low resolution mode. But then when you actually click, hopefully this will work. Yes. So we can now retrieve a, quite a nice image. Now, this is over land at the moment but you can start to see some tantalizing views. And this got people thinking about how we can exploit things further. So you saw this uh, yesterday, uh, but now when you actually use the, the, the tail uh, information in the, in, the, in, the way, in the radar, we can actually produce a, a fully focused star spectrum. Here were some more examples, but Marcel's also processed a little bit more because of course, when you, when you look at the different sub looks within the full aperture, your, you know, your Doppler space is giving you uh, azimuth diversity, which you can see projected in the lower plots here from the wave spectra there. So this is something that we can actually take a little bit further. And likewise, a cross spectra between looks gives you access to a little bit of wave propagation direction, depending on where you're looking. So there's a lot more work that can be done with these kind of altimeters. Uh, here's another example over an atoll. It's a Sentinel-2 image behind, a uh, very high resolution. You can see the ground track of Sentinel-6. Uh, this is what you can process in terms of an image. And you can see here now that the, uh, uh, the waves uh, from this side of the swath have been folded back over because clearly there's no waves in the atoll area at all. So this is what I'm saying, that there's some interpretation issues to handle here. But once we get to learn how to do this, then I think we've got some really exciting data sets. With Sentinel-3, we have a similar capability, but we won't dwell too much. We've got four of those. We've got two to launch, and we're getting ready to do that now. At this point, I'll ask Fab to just come and explain what he did uh, with the swells in the, uh, in the sea ice. There's a different example here. Oh, the, this is, this is uh, just uh, an introduction of the... What what the future mission can help uh, for the for the sea ice? So we we've been looking at uh, many different uh, instruments to look at waves in the ice. So and this is a this is an uh, optical uh, uh, satellite. So it's uh, Sentinel two. But uh, so the idea is that uh, of course um, there there are very little uh, planning to have this uh, Sentinel two uh, uh, image over the the sea ice because it's very uh, uh, rare observation under sunlight because um, a large part of the, the time is uh, under the uh, in the night or under the clouds. So uh, so, so actually uh, that, that's why the, the Sentinel six, uh, Sentinel three and Sentinel six uh, fully focused uh, SAR yeah, can be very, very helpful to uh, to look at the wave propagation in the sea ice. 
So of course, uh, you have the 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 flipping between the left and the right part of the uh, of the track. So this is something that uh, we are looking at at the moment how to uh, how to unflip the, the information based on uh, ancillary also information that we can have from uh, from Sentinel One and and from model to, uh, to 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 be able to separate uh, both cases and also looking at the at the cross spectra. And, uh, and 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 uh, last, I want also to uh, to talk about this um, this possible. It's not an agreed uh, future mission, but it's uh, how to go uh, from uh, the the multi azimut uh, observation uh, configuration that we have uh, planned for uh, SAR, like an harmony on um, on optical uh, data. So it's it will be like a, a geo leo. Uh, SAR version, but uh, optical this time. So it's a bit like uh, with uh, the MISER instrument on uh, on MERIS, where you have uh, an azimutal uh, uh, diversity observation. Uh, so now this this is uh, estimation. This is from only uh, one uh, um, one op observation from uh, like Sentinel two, and just uh, using the um, the fact that uh, you have. A, Actual multi azimut already in uh, Sentinel 2, but it's very uh, low diversity. So you have a, a very small time difference between the different detectors, and so from that you can estimate uh, information on the on the wave motion by looking at the phase dispersion relation. But uh, this is not an optimal uh, configuration to look at uh, the ocean, and that's why uh, there have been some propositions to extend. What uh, Miser is doing is uh, as a glitter, uh, uh, glitter optical uh, um, uh, capabilities. So if you see uh, the Miser uh, instrument that is looking at different azimuts, if you look at all the azimuts, so you have the the black arrows are the actual uh, direction of the specular slopes that are rotating during the the satellite uh, overpass, and you see that you you have the the signature of the of the sea surface, be it the, the atmospheric and the oceanic uh, fronts, are uh, completely different, uh, dependent on the depending on the azimuth relative to the, uh, the the short scale, the short wave scale. And you see that when we rotate, at some point when you, uh, when the oceanic feature are cross, the wind is uh, is in cross direction compared to the view. Something is appearing, and then uh, with a different uh, direction, it disappears, and then you observe mostly uh, atmospheric feature. So, in fact, the, the, the idea is to have uh, to have uh, this to use this uh, beautiful solar illumination when it's uh, when it's cloud free, and have a multiple uh, multiple azimuth look, and so to have uh, um, to analyze the, the, the sun glitter uh, in a in a quite consistent way. So here we we see the the satellite track uh, that is uh, pretty straight, and uh, you have the sun, and then you have the the, the specular uh, the specular angle the, the specular facet um, uh, that is uh, rotating in a, around the, the direction between the sun and the satellite. So you have the you observe the sea surface with a really uh, a vari a large variety of azimuth, and so from uh, by by combining uh, uh, the the large azimuth diversity you have on the miser and the uh, and the small azimuth diversity you have on the sentinel 2 but with a with a very high coherency you can at the same time uh, measure the wave uh, propagation and therefore the surface current and at the same time observe the effect of the surface current on the sea surface roughness which is very directional and requires to have several azimuth so, so uh, that could be a future mission to have a, a combined uh, short lag and long lag uh, observation of the, of the sea surface glitter with multiple azimuth. And so... Uh... And the, the point of that is, once well, a SAR meeting, is that we need to still interpret our SAR, exactly what we were talking about this morning with the imagets. Here with the glitter, when we've got cloud-free conditions, we are seeing things in a very different way, but they're manifestations of the sea surface, which we can then use to aid our interpretation of the SAR. So just continuing quickly with the crystal mission, another uh, altimeter, but this time KA and KU band. Um, 
And these are both, there's a Tsar altimeter. It's got a long heritage uh, from several different instruments that we have in Europe. Um, it's got coverage that extends right up to 89 degrees north, I think, which is one of the big benefits. And a, and a very special orbit repeat similar to Quiasat so that we can actually acquire uh, uh, as much data as possible uh, to satisfy the user needs. The launch here will be in 2027-28, uh, uh, depending on how everything goes, towards the end of 27. This is the mode mask, a preliminary mode mask. We've got open burst, closed burst uh, with SAR in, and then the SAR in, in, in closed burst over most of the ocean. Uh, but the point, again, of showing you this is uh, that there's a lot of work that's been done, and I'll hand over to Albert here, uh, looking at the fully focused SAR processing over sea ice, which is quite useful. Thanks, Greg. Yeah, so we uh, have are trying to understand um, the benefits of having, as you said at the very beginning, all the hierarchy from Cryosat 2 mainly, and then incorporating um, the open bars from Sentinel-6 and putting everything in place uh, over, over CI, so we would have full benefits of CI. So this is a particular location, Athabasca Lake in Canada, where we have um, collocated in space and time um, passes between um, Sent uh, Sentinel-6 and Cryosat 2. Yeah, so this is uh, just an optical image um, um, with the Sentinel-6 track. And then you can identify at the bottom some leads. They are just labeled like that. And then if we look at the radagrams that we can get with Sentinel-6, so this is the um, conventional SAR processing that we are used to do, uh, like SAR uh, delay Doppler, and it's quite blurred. But then, uh, yeah, we can sort of identify big fixtures yeah, but then we have this folding. But um, as long as the features are clearly um, uh, placed in one side or the other, uh, we are able to retrieve uh, pretty, pretty much um, um, and well um, what we want um, to detect uh, thanks to the fully focus. So this is um, quite an advantage that we will get uh, just single with single antenna. If you um, now consider also um, time variability, so we would have uh, uh, also the, the availability uh, to monitor um, melting season, all the different sea ice conditions that we would have uh, with um, different um, uh, thicknesses and, and also uh, gaps. So we would have here when the sea ice starts breaking all the different surfaces that we would be able to classify. And then, yeah, just another geometry. So we would be able to see with more detail when we have a leads crossing the ground track. So the, the top one is the conventional uh, delay Doppler, and the bottom one is where we have the fully focused, and we will be able to uh, make some uh, better estimates of uh, position and, and characteristics of the leads. And also, if we incorporate now the, the second channel uh, that uh, we'll have. Uh, or we allow us to do interferometry, we would see here in the bottom plot where we have the phase difference from the, uh, the two antennas. Uh, you could see here, uh, yeah, go back, you could see here the, um, the particular uh, the transition between um, a yellow to, to red when we have the lead in one side that goes to the other side. So we would be able to, to properly uh, locate in one side of the um, ground track or the other side, whatever we are classifying. And, and not only that, but also another features like the island here, shorelines. So this is quite um, a full exp exploration of uh, both uh, interferometry and fully focused. Now looking at uh, yeah, open, op uh, open sea ice uh, case, uh, not just a lake, so we have uh, leads and, and we will be able to, let's say, make some feature classification as well. So this is more or less all what we can identify from the optical image. And we can also uh, see uh, several uh, features on the radagram. So we have removed the leading edge here just to focus on the trailing edge. And we are able to, to have this uh, classify and we would be able to make some uh, um, 
machine learning or, or in, incorporate new techniques uh, or image processing uh, just to, to better understand what we can extract from, um, from this image. So this is something that it's, has come up in the, in the past years thanks to uh, uh, work from Alejandro and, and, and now all the groups are trying to build up some new algorithms to measure uh, um, re retrievals on, on these new, this new uh, data sets from altimetry. So we can measure sea ice percentage. Uh, and yeah, related with the iceberg, we would be able also to measure uh, on a better way. Uh, so on left, on, on the middle of the image, you have uh, unfocused uh, retrievals that we would be able just barely classify big icebergs. But then on the right side, you would see the benefits of the fully focused with a, a thinner resolution. And, and we could extract better characteristics. Just uh, uh, point out some points uh, for the discussion. So um, it's been um, discussed now uh, if uh, we would need to, to mispoint a bit crystal in order to, to have um, sort of a this ambiguity between left and right as Cresat has this open one uh, role uh, is pointing. So it will help or it will be um, beneficial for, for this disambiguity. Then related with the penetration of the KA and the KU, and there are some studies uh, after the Mosaic expedition. We have uh, also developed some simulations and we are trying to make also theoretical assessment on, on how uh, KU is penetrating and how, what are the interfaces and what are we really measuring when we measuring the um, uh, freeboard from KU and KA. And then just an open point is uh, we are having priorities in this mission. So it's a cryosphere mission. We have sea ice and land ice and we have interferometric there. And ocean and inland waters are just a single channel, but they are closed bars and, and there is a, yeah, duty uh, data rate issue as well, but they have been, let's say, left over for, from the open bars and all, all these fully focused benefits. So it could be beneficial for ocean community and inland community to have uh, also so at least some um, acquisitions in, in open bars. Yeah, and yes. Thanks, Albert. Okay, so Albert's here if you want to have a chat. Um, right, I'll race through the last parts now. Uh, Sentinel-1, probably don't really need to talk too much about this. You you know Sentinel-1. Uh, but Sentinel-1 Next Generation is being developed right now. So here we want continuity and expansion of the services that rely on Sentinel-1. And we want new applications. So today the performance has to be equal or better than what we had, have in the first generation. We're going for a three-day revisit globally, uh, half a day in the Arctic for the sea ice, a resolution of less than 25 meters, uh, noise equivalent signal zero of minus 26 dB, and then the full continuity and dual pole and quad pole capability. So we have different modes. Um, we will be using the same orbit as the first generation with Roselle, and Roselle will be built in, cons in, in concert with Sentinel-1 and uh, the next generation. So summary, I'm not going to read this. You can you can look at this yourselves afterwards, but uh, the main performance requirements are here. Um, but of course, the next generation imaging is likely to come from the lower uh, noise equivalent sigma zero. And this will give us a lot, lot better capability to map and characterize uh, the weak scatterers. So you can see here the standard eight looks, the the the, uh, the Sentinel-1 soil moisture and the intermetric uh, wide swath at four loops. Uh, Okay, so where we are at the moment, we are in um, we are in the phase AB1. Uh, it's been done 2021 to 2023. Uh, the preliminary requirements review will conclude uh, later this year, and then we'll be putting out the ITT for the development um, in the latter part of this year, with a launch expected in 2032. So it's a while off, but that time will go very quickly, I can assure you. Uh, in terms of Roselle, uh, this is the L-band uh, 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 mission. Uh, it's operational monitoring of uh, over high resolution for sea ice and snow water equivalent, maritime monitoring and oil spill and, and vessel detection. And really, Roselle is filling the gap um, a little bit uh, and, and maintaining continuity um, with the Sentinel-1s. Now, as you know, um, 
we expect hopefully to get the Sentinel 1C up um, as soon as we've resolved some issues with our launches, but uh, that's all playing out quite well at the moment. Um, Harmony will be launched at the same time, all being well, so we will be in good shape to have Roselle, uh, the Sentinel 1 next gen, uh, with Harmony and Sentinel 1 DNC. So it's a two satellite constellation with options that are still being under study. Um, we'll have global land, uh, ex excluding Antarctica and, uh, and the Arctic. We've got a revisit with uh, two satellites, six days for the global, three days in Europe, and one day repeat in the Arctic. Um, we've got 85 megahertz uh, bandwidth allowed by the ITU, and dual pole and quad pole modes with a wave mode capability. So it's quite a formidable companion to work with Sentinel-1. Geohazards, land use, soil moisture, maritime, and marine monitoring in Chrysler and Arctic, all supporting the Copernicus services. Uh, just an example here, looking at uh, the C-band HH from Radarsat 2, together with the ALOS 2, L-band and HV. So we're going to have some complementary information here, and it's going to be quite nice to work uh, with all of these different data. Same for seasonal snow and, and, and land ice. We hope to be getting enhanced uh, ice velocity retrievals uh, and new se seasonal uh, snow for our modeling. Okay, so I'm not going to dwell on these. Um, you can look at these afterwards. Um, status, as I say, we're, we're, we're in the middle of everything, so it's coming. So in terms of the current Sentinel-1 mission, uh, this, there is a Sentinel-1 quality working group, which will restart soon. So this will be in September and focus on the level two users, which includes you. And we're looking for feedback on Sentinel-1 level one and two products. Uh, and this will also be a forum to start discussing uh, level two Roselle products um, to be generated potentially by us. And Marielle's in here. Put your hand up, Marielle. Talk to Marielle. She will help you if you want to join and get involved with that group. Okay. We have now just a short review because it was new missions. And while we didn't have an abstract, that felt wrong after the, the, the discussions we had this morning not to include Nizar. Nizar. Oh, God, I had 50% chance of getting it right then. <laughs> My statistics are against me. <laughs> oh, yes. This one's better. Oh, okay. This one doesn't work at all. Okay. Uh, are my slides after yours? I'll just go directly. Yeah. Go. Okay. So, uh, NISAR is a collaboration between NASA and the Indian Space uh, Research Organization. We're going to launch in January 2024. Uh, the picture at the bottom right is uh, a couple of years old now. It shows the size of the uh, reflector, a 12-meter diameter reflector. Uh, there's going to be two radars on board, the L-band uh, radar that uh, provides global land and uh, sea ice within the imaging area, uh, and then S-band, which is collected over India's areas of interest, which you'll see a coverage map shortly. 12-day uh, repeat and products delivered within about uh, 24 hours is uh, the goal, and uh, five hours for disaster response. And all of the data will be free and open and hosted at the ASF DAC. Uh, so as far as requirements, uh, there are requirements for cryosphere, for the ecosystems, and for solid earth deformation. Uh, coastal processes is uh, also uh, uh, a goal of the Indians more than the U.S., although uh, we certainly uh, consider e that uh, coastal ecosystems as part of uh, the... And uh, cross-cutting across all of them is uh, hazard response. We do have a requirement for uh, hazard response, which uh, involves... Um, uh, retasking the instrument for ocean observations that are not in the normal plan and, uh, and rapid processing for anything on land because it's going to already be acquired. Um, let's see, instrument characteristics. So you, I'll leave this slide will be there. Uh, main thing is that almost all of the data, uh, global land data, will be collected in dual pole. Um, and it'll have a 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. Or orbit. Uh, it'll go to the Arctic to 77.5 uh, 
latitude slightly below where we are, unfortunately. And uh, it's left looking, so it'll really get great coverage for Antarctica, uh, better than anything had. Uh, the measurement technique, it's a 240 uh, kilometer swath. It uses a new uh, technique called SweepSAR. On transmit, you el illuminate the entire swath, and on uh, receive, you steer the beams so that you uh, follow the echoes that are coming back. And that means that uh, echoes from different pulses will be interleaved on receive, and so there will be onboard processing that uh, puts those all back together. And so all of that onboard processing has, is not is not reversible, so there will be a lot of calibration um, and uh, work on that algorithm. So there's a, a lot of calvel. Uh, the observation plan is shown here. It's uh, fairly straightforward, despite all the colors. Um, the uh, North America and US territories are collected in 40 megahertz dual pole mo mode with uh, small areas of quad pole mode that are used for ecosystem studies. Um, the background land globally is collected in 20 megahertz uh, mode. So, you know, we're talking about uh, 12, uh, roughly 10 meter uh, spatial resolution, 12 meter versus six meter in uh, North America. Um, the little blue dots uh, spread all over the globe are urban areas where they are also collected in higher resolution mode. Uh, to help with uh, disaster response. Uh, for sea ice, we'll be collected in light pink mode up there, five megahertz, so uh, 50 meter resolution. Uh, it'll have slightly better noise equivalent sigma naught than the uh, higher bandwidth mode, so. And then um, the area around uh, India is gonna be collected with both LSAR and ASAR. And I mean, SR and LSR, and they're also interested in collecting the same for Svalbard and parts of Antarctica uh, will also be collected in L and S. Um, since uh, we're collecting nearly all the land all the time, uh, most disasters will be automatically imaged as soon as possible. Uh, there'll be a, a, a system for requesting urgent response data, and in the case of a land a disaster, all that happens is that there's very rapid processing of the data, uh, and then um, with a low uh, uh, accuracy or orbit ephemeris solution, and then uh, the high accuracy orbit uh, ephemeris will be used for the standard product, since uh, most of this is used for NSAR. We've added uh, the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean Sea to the standard plan. That was done because the expectation was that there's gonna be a lot of disasters there, a lot of tropical storms and hurricanes, and they didn't wanna be constantly retasking the satellite in order to acquire that data. So just to get me to shut up, they just add, added it in. <laughs> and then uh, um, all of those uh, urban background uh, of course, we added high resolution data for the North America. That was an add on, a uh, new ground station was installed. And um, the selected urban areas globally, you can see there's a whole lot of area there and they'll be collected in 40 megahertz. And so uh, that's the kind of areas that I'm trying to trade off the, the uh, uh, volume, data volume, in order to add the East Coast, a little more coastal oceans. So if we suggest something from here, then we'll go in and probably do a trade on this, these background areas. Right. So these, uh, all of these uh, data products will be provided uh, through level uh, two within 24 hours, level three is validation only, and then there's a global soil moisture product and uh, a separate project is going to be doing a global surface water extent product, a global disturbance product, and a North America deformation product. Thank you. Great. Great. Okay. So that's a new one that's coming in pretty quick soon. There's another one here. It's a matrix. It's a microwave radiometer. Since we discussed a little bit this morning microwave radiometry and how that can be used to help a little bit. 
Um, Simmer is uh, uh, expected in 2029, first unit. That's an eight meter rotating uh, deployable mesh reflector. And we have channels at K, KU, um, XC and L band. Uh, I'm not gonna dwell on it too much, uh, but just to show you for the ice in particular, this is gonna be really useful, but also as a matrix into which we can drop everything. Um, and then interpret data together. That's quite important. So the last I think we have to cover now will be the Sentinel-3 next generation topo, which Alejandro, who's the mission scientist at ESA, will take us through now. Thanks. So this is the next generation of altimeters for Sentinel-3. And here we will be targeting the useful altimetric parameters, so wind, waves, sea surface side, sea level rise, uh, CAs and ice sheets, for to name a few, but also uh, inland waters. And you can see here, it, this is a, a cartoon of uh, how little open water of uh, rivers and lakes represent in relationship to the whole Earth and on the available water in the planet, but still is like a key element for human well-being and even survival. So this is considered now as a primary objective from, for the mission. The mission requirements stem from user needs from uh, official European Commission documents. And there is a very strong need to uh, keep the continuity of these measurements. And it is actually uh, recognized and uh, consolidated in, in the mission requirement document uh, as the primary objective of the mission to guarantee the continuity of the Sentinel-3 topography uh, parameters, uh, all of them, sea surface side, significant wave height, youth and winds, etc. And also to expand the mission coverage in terms of temporal sampling and also, and also a spatial revisit, together with the, what I mentioned before also of expanding the hydrology component of the mission. Um, other elements such as directional wave spectra uh, were recognized as, in, as secondary objectives of the mission. However, those are still, uh, uh, they will still be produced in routine over the ocean. So, and that is going to be a very interesting uh, uh, data source for this group, for sure. So we had uh, PCR last year, July, um, for this mission, answering to the needs that I uh, presented in the previous slide, we had two mission concepts in competition, a constellation of 10 to 12 nadir looking SAR altimeters or two thrusts. And after the PCR outcome and also after programmatic assessment, uh, it was decided to go on with two dedicated large satellites carrying wide swath altimeters, um, similar to the SWAT concept that uh, you might have heard about. So this is just a cartoon uh, showing how the uh, swath altimeter looks. So basically we have two uh, antennas across track and this is an across track interferometric instrument. So we have uh, two swaths on each side of the track and that will be covered by this swath altimeter and, and neither subsatellite track which will be covered also by a SAR uh, nadir looking altimeter. Uh, let's see. We have uh, two main operation modes of this instrument, a low resolution for open ocean and land ice, which will be, uh, will give you a resolution in azimuth of 250 meters and a high resolution uh, mode that uh, will be around 35 meter resolution along track. Uh, on a cross track, we'll have around 70 to 10 meter resolution, and this is a typo here. So, uh, 10, 70 meters will be near range, 10 meters in the far range, of course. And we will have a continuous wave uh, mode operation over the ocean to get the two dimensional, uh, two D directional spectra. Um, yeah, I have here major implementation of onboard processing since the data rate is enormous. Uh, and however, in the HR mode, we will be able to have access to the, to the actual echoes uh, retrieved by the interferometer, 
with some caveats, but there, there's still a lot of room uh, to play there. Uh, so 14 months after the launch of SWOT and also as an outcome of the PCR, it was decided to have a mission gate review in which uh, it will be evaluated all the outcomes of the ISRR and also this uh, in SWOT, uh, in-flight uh, performance from SWOT to consider the viability of this Sentinel-3 next-gen topo concept. And this is just for eye candy. This is uh, showing the uh, SWOT path over off the coast of uh, East uh, US, showing there all the, um, let's see, high variability that SWOT observes uh, across the SWOT from the, from the interferometer. And for reference, this is, these are the, the footprints from the nether looking altimeter that SWOT has as well. So showing the increased detail in the, in the SWOT uh, altimeter signal that they can have here. Yeah. Thanks. It's Alejandro. Okay, so let's try this. I don't know if it'll work. I'm gonna break it again. Let me see, can, can, I, can I break it? Oh. Oh, I can't see. It. I can't start it. Starting. Spacebar. Oh, okay. That's a pity. Oh, Yes. Yay. Nay. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. Sorry. Nay. Oh, well. When it does go, oh, maybe if I just click in the middle. Oh, look. Anyway. Okay, well, that is actually quite a nice little animation, which we'll try and show at another time, which shows what we're looking at in the coming years. And uh, there's a lot of lot of instruments here, and the coverage is quite spectacular. So, fortunately, you can't see it. But never mind. Okay. The main thing to think about, though, now is that we've got a lot of data. I don't know what I can see is different here. And what are we going to do with all of this data? Because it's almost impossible to manage all of it. Uh, it's not impossible, but almost impossible. And we're moving to new ideas. But you can see here, um, we observe everything down to 10 meters resolution through different means uh, every five days. This is just from the European Space Agency. You've got 250 terabytes of data every day coming in. So we need to find ways to make sense of how we use all of this data. And you've seen mentioned a couple of times the Ocean Virtual Laboratory, which is one way of finding and looking at data. I encourage you to have a quick look at that. A very, very powerful interface for finding and, and, and working with data to ask questions. Then you go and get the data and do further processing. Uh, and likewise, uh, we need to make sure that we have uh, sustainable ways of performing our validation in sites like Svalbard, which is a sort of natural laboratory in itself. And for the Arctic, this is a very sensitive area. And we know now, one of the reasons we brought you here as well is because we can make contacts and work with the people at UNIS to try to leverage what can be offered here in terms of CalVal. It's very important, it's expensive, but I think you'd agree it's quite a nice place to come and it's got great potential for helping us work with our space data in some of the more difficult, challenging areas, especially as you've got experts that can get out in the field and they know how to handle the cold, they know how to handle the ice. We think it's great, but it's a killer, and we need experts and professionals to help us. So in conclusion, um, well, I think we've been part of um, two decades since uh, the 2003 meeting, uh, where we've seen profound changes in Earth observation, not just to the European Space Agency, but globally. And I think many of the dreams that perhaps people had at the time in 2003 have now materialized. Okay, they bring additional challenges, additional problems, additional uh, snippets of diamond science that we're still fiddling with and playing with and trying to resolve. But I think it's amazing what we've got in our hands today, it really is. The evidence base that's been built today is an enormous potential to support a growing number of different applications 
across all different domains. Okay, we're CSAR, uh, but of course these spacecraft uh, work in many different areas. There are still fundamental challenges. Uh, data volume is just one of them. And, and the discussion we had in the late part of the morning about interpretation of complex SAR imagery is another. But that's our job. We're supposed to be the scientists that are getting to grips with the data. So keeping on top of this and keeping, uh, keeping moving is, is what the game is all about. I think we do have a massive, rich and growing data archive for reanalysis for climate activities. And that's an unparalleled scientific evidence base. And I use that term wisely, evidence base, because these, are, these measurements are critical. Because if you want to be, if you're a government, um, both nationally or if you're a local government, you need an evidence base that you've got confidence in to make decisions that matter today about mitigating some of the issues that we face in a changing climate. Uh, so that stems to policy, not just the generation of policies, but also monitoring the impact of those policies, not just in the countries and areas that those policies are directed at, but globally, because some changes in different parts of the world have profound impacts elsewhere. And the Arctic is one classic example. The Arctic is quite pristine, yet it's the area that's warming faster than all of the others. So I would say bring on the next decade and let's see if we can make sense of all the other things that are coming together with what we have in our hand today. And I think from the summary today, I'm out of sync here. Now I'm in sync. Oh, this is my last slide. I'm on time as well. Look at that. Not bad. So we have a large, I mean, just thinking about things we need to discuss and, and take further in the breakouts now. We've got a large number of missions with SAR capability uh, across different areas. Okay, fine. We've got a, now a diversification of technologies. We've got XC, P, L, K, K, U, S band. Uh, S band should be there as well. Um, we've got new techniques, new polarimetric capabilities. We've got the harmonies, the GeoSAR. We've got some exciting things coming. Um, this is all relevant to an emerging focus on air-sea interaction. The air-sea interaction is fundamental to understand our climate. After all, the, the ocean is 74% of the planet. This is where, you know, this is, our, this is our climate flywheel. So that's nice to see. And, of course, we see the surface manifestations of all of those processes, and particularly with the radars, very sensitive to both the atmosphere and the ocean parameters. So for me, that's what I love. I mean, interpretation of some of that complex imagery is just fantastic because you're thinking process, process, process. But explaining that process and linking what we see at the surface to the deeper ocean and to the upper atmosphere is really, really difficult. So it's great to see the approaches in Harmony. It's great to see the approaches in CSTAR. We've got NISAR coming, plus the Altimeters, plus Roselle, plus the continuation of Sentinel-1. So uh, we have a lot of data. We know that working with some of this data is very challenging. And one of the recommendations we'd like to put forward, at least um, to start the discussion, is for some of the more complex radar data and other data, it'd be nice to have some Jupyter notebooks that just open the data and plot a simple plot on the screen. So and then a little bit of a, a comment field in the middle, put your code here so you can do something. But we're all writing the same interfaces to open a data set and get it up on your computer to work with it. It would be really nice for, for the for agencies now, and we have to think about that, the European Space Agency, to be able to provide very simple tools to get you into the data quickly. Um, and I think the Jupyter Notebooks has been shown to be a very easy way to work. Christine raised an issue here about orbits. Maybe this is Christine. No. Um, mostly sun synchronous, uh, 6 a.m., 6 p.m. Uh, what about diurnal processes? How do we handle those? So GSR, maybe that's one way to do it, but it needs thinking about, and maybe that isn't possible. But we miss a lot of the diurnal processes, and we know that matters. We can see that in the, in, in the optical imagery that we acquire from geostationary orbit. It's a little bit more tricky sometimes to find it in some data sets, the altimeter, contrary to what I would have thought as a scientist intuitively. But we do have trouble at the moment, trying to establish that for particular orbit changes. And how can we improve the engagement with the broader geoscience and modeling communities? You know, we always talk about data assimilation, yet a lot of radar data is not necessarily assimilated. It's not in the right form for people yet. So we need to think a bit about that. How can we actually 
leverage what we have in the way that makes it easy for the modeling community to take full advantage of the data. And of course, one way to move some of that thing on is large international science-driven multi-sensor projects. Um, Paco was talking last night about, you know, he'd like to have spa boys in the ocean to look at uh, high resolution air sea interaction as part of harmony. Well, I think most people in this room will be saying, hey, man, I want to be part of that as well. So there are real needs and there's a real opportunity to make something happen here. It's our community. Uh, don't worry about the money. It will come as long as there's a good enough proposal on the ground to make it happen. So that's something to really consider. There's a good opportunity at CSAR. So, okay, I'll finish with that. And thank you for your time. I think it's coffee. Um, we will use the breakouts for our, our main discussion, as I said, when I opened this session. And I can show you the beautiful imagery of Wombay. Thank you, Craig. You did leave me with the broken computer again. No, no, it works. Uh, yes, uh, about the breakout groups, a couple of practical things. Do people know which breakout group they are going to attend? Or are there still people going, eh, I'm not really sure, torn? <laughs> yep, I will. I'm just going to open the PowerPoint. There we go. Um, so uh, today, all of the eight groups are going to be at UNIS. So in this building, you do not need to leave the building to get into your breakout rooms. So uh, Moisalin is this one where we're sitting here. Right now, the wave retrieval group will be here. Sea ice is in Kopvik. It's one of the classrooms. Uh, when you start walking towards the main entrance, it will be on your left-hand side. Operations room is um, you pass the reception and go further. Uh, if you're in the ops room, find some of the locals to show you it's not trivial to find it. Uh, one Koilen and one Mayan rooms are small meeting rooms on the second and third floor of this building. Same thing, when we are done with coffee, have one of the locals to escort you there. Cat can show you where they are. Uh, Festingen is very close. It's uh, by the closest toilet here. So you just go out this room, it's on your left. Uh, cup Schultz, once again, a cup room on your way when you walk towards the entrance and the nonsense center office on third floor impossible to find unless you have a local guide so uh, yeah uh there are with two exceptions uh there are webex meetings set up the way they should work is you walk into the room and you say okay webex start meeting if it doesn't we'll come and check up on you uh Anyway, to see that everything works. Uh, the links to the meetings have been sent out. Uh, yes, and finally, uh, there's the visit to Swalbot Museum. It's a really, really good museum. Don't miss this. There will also be free drinks, I guess. Uh, we meet half past five outside. The museum is in the same building as Eunice, but you can't enter the museum without leaving the building. Uh, half past five at the UNIS entrance. Uh, yeah, there is a map. I'm not going to leave it there. And uh, for tomorrow, I will make sure that all of the chairs have pointers to the rooms tomorrow, because not all of them are at UNIS. Uh, don't don't leave yet. There is one key thing that that you should know all uh, bring with you uh, for the panels, and those that even may not be able to follow all the panel and the closing session on Saturday. And that's a timeline towards when 
the white papers are completed. Not in draft form, but in final form. And I did say at the beginning on uh, Tuesday that I think that what we have uh, at our hands here and what we can deliver will be highly interesting for the European Space Agency and probably for several other space agencies as well. But one reason for why we have a bit of a target of the European Space Agency is that they are going to create the next strategy document in May 2024. So if we want to have some serious influence on that strategy document, it means that we have to have all our complete white papers done well in time. That doesn't mean 31st of April 2024. It means, in fact, by the end of this year. White papers completed in December 2023. That is the target, and each of the co-chairs need know to take this message with them to the panels and to backtrack that timeline as to today and how you are going to manage to get this one evolving into a final, complete, and uh, edited white paper by uh, December 23. And I shall also set up a list of uh, internal reviewers because we are not going to just make these without having some kind of internal checking on them. So there will be a bunch of reviewers also that is going to look at the white papers, just to make sure that they are slick and clean and doesn't include any sillies. So that's this message. And as a result of that, since we are so good with you on this, you are going to now have an extra 30 minutes of time on Saturday morning. We do not start until 9 o'clock. So the bus from Nubian leaves at 8.45. So that's the uh, thanks for what you are doing to us, and this is what we therefore give back to you. <laughs> okay, did I forget anything, Kat?